Hello, welcome to this video. This is uh, from the UQ library, and it's another video about R and RStudio and using the tidyverse to do a bit of data science. So in this video, we're looking at two specific packages from this suite of packages, um, which is called the tidyverse. And we've got, in previous videos, dplyr, ggplot2, that we already had a thorough look at. Today, we're going to have a look at tidyr and Per. Tidy R is mostly used for uh, tidying your data to make your tabular data tidy before you do an analysis. And per is used to iterate over more complex vectors. So instead of using the base R loops, you can use per functions to make your life a bit easier. So let's get into it. This is the Tidyverse website. As you can see, we've got the main uh, or six main packages that are listed here. You can see on the left here, dplyr and ggplot2, so data manipulation and data visualization. And today, again, looking at tidyr and per, we will be using the table uh, type of data storage or data class table, and also be using a function from readr to import the data. If you want to install the whole tidyverse uh, in R, you can use this command, install the packages tidyverse. You will install the core packages as well as their dependencies. If you want more details about this uh, group of packages, that we also call dialect of R, you can go to packages and read a bit more about those. Scroll through those. You can see that there's also string R, which is very central to manipulate strings of characters and forecats to manipulate uh, factors. So let's get into it. I'm going to go to R Studio here, and I've got a brand new R session. I'm going to go to the project menu to create a new project to keep everything nicely contained. Click New Project, and we're going to create a new directory. New projects is the project type. I'm happy with this basic new project, nothing special here. And I'm going to save that into my R projects. This one is going to be called Tidyverse Next Steps. A bit of a generic uh, name here, so we will work with one data set mainly, and we'll try and tie it all in together at the end of the session. Um, hopefully it will all make sense, but we are looking kind of at two distinct packages and making sense of them because they, have, they are very important. So I'm happy with the details here, the title, and where I'm saving my project. I'm going to click Create Project. And this starts a new R session on the left here. And we've got our current working directory being tidyverse next steps, as you can see it up here. Currently, we only have the approach file in there, and our environment is empty. Now, for today's session, we've got the notes available online. You can find the link in the description of the video. Uh, this is our notes for today, so you don't really need to write anything to the side. Mostly, what I want to do is uh, write the code at the same time as you, if you can do that in our studio to uh, really practice writing and coding. The data set that we'll be using, there is also a link uh, in the description. So we'll be using this URL here. And I'm going to copy that to the clipboard straight away. So I can import it without having to type it entirely. Another bit of setting up that we need to do is create a new script, so we can store our code and write it more comfortably. I can use the new file menu here and the R script option here. There's also the option to use the shortcut Control Shift N. So there's our source pane, where we can start typing a little bit of context as a comment. So let's go with the description here. Next steps in the tidyverse. with tidyr and per.
on today's date. That's in 2019, September the 27th. OK. So again, if you need to install the packages, install the packages, and then the string tidyverse. This should work. You can execute that. It will take a while because there's quite a few packages and quite a few dependencies. I won't execute it here as I already have it on my computer. But you can also use the packages pane and click on install. And all, this, all the same, you can look for the package tidyverse on the official CRAN repositories. Here it is, tidyverse. But I already have everything I need on this computer, so I'm going to stick to only loading the tidyverse to start with. We'll be using the library function and remember that to execute from the script window or the script pane, you can use control enter. You can see that it sends the command to the console. Here it is. And it gives you a little bit of output. It's nicely formatted here. It tells us that it's attaching or loading the main packages from the tidyverse. I've got ggplot2, tibble, tidyr, readr, per, dplyr, stringr, and four cats. And it also mentions the conflicts that exists that exist between functions from dplyr and stats. So let's talk about tidy data because we're going to be using functions from tidyr to uh, order or to tidyr data to make it easier to use with functions. So tidy data is data that contains um, only one observation per row. So that's very important. It also contains only one variable per column and it contains one single value per cell. So that's what we call tidy data. We'll see that what we import today is a pretty messy data set that we need to work a bit on. Um, it's not always the case that you can make a data set fit those principles. Really, there's lots of different cases, but often you can try and reshape your data to get to that point, and that's what we're going to do today. So let's have a look at this data set. Import some data. And this one is from the World Bank. It's a climate data set. Um, it has data up to 2011, so not particularly ideal, but it is a good example of a messy data set. I might go straight to using a function from uh, the readr package. And the function is called read underscore CSV. So not read.csv, which would be from base R, but read underscore CSV. I'm going to try and stick to the tidyverse as much as we can here. Climate row is the name of the object that I'm going to save the data in. And here I can specify straight away the URL where the data is, gonna, is, is uh, stored. You can see that it's a CSV file, comma separated values. And just like read.csv, read underscore CSV can take a URL as well as a path on your own computer. So I'll execute this and see what happens. We can see a new object here in my environment, climate raw, that has 1165 observations of 28 variables, that's our columns. There's also a little bit of feedback in the console here that tells us what kind of specifications it has used for each column. But if you want to see everything, you can use this function. It tells us that, for example, for scale and decimals, it has used the double specification. We can see how the data was imported. We've got a country code, country name here, a series code, series name, scale, decimals, and then all the years of data stored as separate columns. So there's already something that we can notice here with our data not being um, tidy. We need to modify our read.csv or read underscore csv, sorry, uh, function 
because you can see that the numbers stored inside the year columns have been understood as characters, and that's because it has understood the two dots as a string of characters, so everything else is stored as a, as a string of character. We need to make sure that the function understands that the non-available value in this dataset are stored as two dots. That's how the World Bank does it, apparently. If I click on Climate Raw, I can confirm that. It looks like every missing value is coded as two dots. So let's make sure that the read underscore CSV function takes care of that. And we can do that with the NA argument, letting it know that dot dot, the string dot dot, is a non-available value. I can try and execute that again. And now we end up with numerical columns, numerical data in the year columns, as you can see. So this looks a little bit more clean. Now let's take care of our issue that we've got with the years being stored in different variables. We've got lots of numbers in there that should really be stored inside that one single column and then another column that contains the year, the years. So to do that, we'll have to go from a wide data set to a longer data set. Again, if I go back to my spreadsheet view here, you can see that it is a wide format and we want to gather the columns from 1990 all the way to 2011 into two columns, one that contains the years, one that contains the values. So to do that, I'm going to use tidyr to lengthen the data. The new object will be called climate long. And I'm going to use the function pivot underscore longer. So now I should mention that if you've used IDR before, you might be used to the functions gather and spread. Um, that's now the older method. The function, well, the two functions will not go away anytime soon. But now the developers have moved on with a new version 1.0.0 that just was released to uh, a new method, which is using pivot longer and pivot wider. Hopefully, these developments make it a little bit more, um, a little bit easier to understand how they function. I've had certainly issues with uh, trying to remember how gather and spread work and how um, the arguments work. So I think now the pivot longer and pivot wider functions make more sense and are easier to remember. So hopefully it's the same for you. So pivot longer will work with our data set climate raw. That's the one that we start with. And then we'll modify to group together to, uh, well, all the variables that we want to gather. So because we've got names of variables here that are numbers. This is a little bit unconventional. We're going to use backticks to ex escape those special characters and to make sure that the function understands that they are variable names. So use the backticks for that. And we're saying we want the columns from 1990 all the way to 2011. That's what we want to gather. That's what we want to make longer. Now the arguments that we need to provide is names2, and this is where the names of our variables are going to be stored, that's the years. So I'm going to name that new column year. And we also have to say where the values will go, and that's values2. And I'll simply name that value. So we'll end up with two columns, year and value where all the data that's stored in those year variables has been gathered. Let's have a look at that. Looks like it runs without errors. I get a new object called climate long, 
There it is. And now we can see that we don't have those many columns with year headers. We've got one column that's called year with the years in there and a value column with the numbers in there. There is one bit, extra bit of work that we need to do is that the years have been stored as characters. That's the default um, when it takes, when this function pivot longer takes the names of columns, it will store them uh, as characters. So I'm going to use the pipe to then go on to a second step. I'm going to mutate. This is a dplyr verb. And I'm going to replace year with itself, but convert it as an integer. Execute that, and you should end up with same data set, but year is stored as an integer. So now we can make use of those years, for example, in a visualization. If you're not familiar with uh, the pipe that I just used, that percentage greater than percentage uh, special operator, and the verb mutates, I recommend to go back to one of our videos, which is more about dplyr, data transformation, data manipulation with dplyr. Uh, we do explain what those two, or what what the five or six main verbs from dplyr do, and also what the pipe does. Okay, let's go back to looking at our data. Now we've got longer data. That's a bit better, but we still have an issue. There's data here on separate rows that corresponds to the same observation. You can see that there's a series name variable that lists different kinds of data. So I would have to scroll for quite a bit to find another one. But um, for example, here we've got energy use per units, but we've got also other variables that uh, talk about CO2 emissions. For example, there's a few different indicators stored in there. So what we want to do is, instead of having all those values stored in one single variable here, we're going to divide them in between as many variables as there are series names. And that's uh, the opposite operation to pivot longer, and that's going to be called pivot wider. So let's have a look at widening. The first thing we'll do, because we'll be losing those series codes here, or I mean, sorry, these series names, uh, we do want to use the series codes on the left here as the names of our new variables, because they're a bit easier to type. Um, series names, however, is a very long one. We don't want that as variable names, definitely not. We do want to store them for later, for later use, because um, we do want to keep that information, that detailed information about what the code means and what the unit is. So what we can do is store a bit of a code book. I'm going to create a new object called codes and store inside it the unique associations between those two variables that I just mentioned. So we're looking at climate underscore long. And we're going back to base R syntax here. We're going to say that for the two columns, series code and series name, find all the unique matches between those two. So remember that the square bracket notation is the indexing in R. And then we're using nothing between the comma because we don't want to select rows, but we want to select two columns, that's series code and series name. And with the unique function, we're going to find all the matches between those two values and store them as codes. If I execute this, I end up with a tiny data set here, codes that contains series code, series name, but only five rows. I click on it. And this is our code book. We've got the series code and what its signification is with the series name. So this is a good thing to, s to keep on the side, especially because we're going to lose this information 
in the widening process. I notice that I haven't saved my script here. I might click on that floppy disk icon and make sure that I've got a copy before I lose everything. This is my default name for scripts process. And when I save it, it adds this R extension at the end here. So we've stored the codes, or the code book, if you want to call it that, a bit of a reference. And then we can move on to tidying even more our data. So the new object that I'll create is called climate underscore tidy. I'm starting with climate underscore long, using the pipe to send it to the, so the next step. I do want to select or deselect some variables. Remember that dplyr's select function allows you to reorder variables and uh, remove some of them too if you want to. So here I'm going to select or deselect series name. That's the long one that it wa we don't want to keep. And I'm also going to remove with the minus sign before it scale. We don't really need that variable as well as decimals. So if I look at climate long, you can see that it starts with those variables, we've got scale here, decimals, and series name. So we're removing those three and using the pipe again to send it to the next step, which is using pivot wider. I don't have to specify what data I'm making wider because I'm using the pipe that sends it as the first argument of pivot wider. I can go straight to names from, and that's going to be our series code. as well as values from. And that's our gathered data in the value column. OK. Let's execute that. And we've got a third data set here that's called climate tidy. You can see that compared to climate long, it is smaller, as in not as long. It doesn't have as many rows. The original one, or the intermediate one rather, had 25,000 observations. Now we end up with 5,000 or so observations. Still eight variables. That's because we removed a couple. Yeah. If I look at the variables here, I've got tidy data with country code, country name, the year, and then five different indicators here, five different kinds of data recorded in this data set. You can have a look at the data in the spreadsheet viewer. And you can see that whatever was stored inside the value variable here was then spread or widened across five different variables here. OK. So now we end up with a tidier data set. There's a little bit more cleaning up that we want to do. And to do that, uh, we'll go to our course notes, because it's a bit of typing that you probably don't want to do. It's this bit here. And this is to remove the useless country groups. We want to focus on single countries. Unfortunately, this data set contains grouped countries too. You can see it here. For example, Euro area, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to create a list of all those groups. I'm going to save it as groups. It's a vector of character strings of 15 elements. and I will remove it from the data set. I'm going to replace climate tidy by itself, but using a filter verb here. And the condition will be I don't want, so I'm 
inverting the selection here with the exclamation point. I don't want country name. to be included or to be a part of groups. I'm using my list that I just built, groups, and saying every single row that you find in Climate Tidy that is that has country name as this list or as an element on this list, you can remove it. Execute that and you should end up with a slightly smaller data set. You can see that now it has 4,796 observations and it shouldn't have any data related to those groups. Okay. So you can see that we've had to take a little bit of time to use tidy our functions to tidy our data, but now it means that it's in a nice little format that will allow us to put it into, for example, a ggplot command uh, to do a visualization or even associate it to other functions in the tidyverse because they all work really well with this kind of tidy data. So let's have a look at a, an example of a visualization now with ggplot2. So now I can start still using my pipe syntax with the dataset climate tidy. This is our tidied climate, uh, sorry, dataset. <laughs> and I can send it straight to a ggplot function. I don't have to specify where the data comes from. That's what the pipe does. And I'll use the aesthetic function to group my aesthetic elements and associate them to variables. On the x-axis, I want the year. And on the y-axis, I want to visualize the increase in kilotons of CO2 emitted for each country. So I'm going to use this specific variable, a bit of a mouthful, mouthful this one, ENATMCO2EKT, that's kilotons at the end. And finally, I'm going to group that data because I need to mention somewhere that I want to visualize countries separately. So I'm going to use country name here. And after that, I need to specify what geometry I need to use. I'm going to use a geom line here to visualize the data. It does tell me that there's quite a bit of data that is not shown because uh, we've got quite a few missing values. And now we can see separately each country visualize um, with how much kilotons, how many kilotons of CO2 they have emitted. Now, let's have a look at something a bit different. What if we want to have a look at the data for uh, the whole data set, but doing an increase in global CO2 emissions in kiloton stills, still. So I might modify slightly my code. I'll type that again. Instead of separating by country, we're going to have a grouping step. I want to group by year. And then summarize for each year, I want the variable, the new variable called CO2, to be the sum of the variable we used before. So when you've got long variable names, make sure that you use the auto uh, complete. That's with the tab key. We want to use this one here. So we're going to do the sum of all that, but remember that we've got non available value, so we're going to use the na.rm argument and set it to true as opposed to the default false. We can then send that to ggplot. And here we only need to specify two aesthetic elements, the two axes, because we've aggregated the data. And we still, oh no, we want to change that to a point geometry. So if you type that right, you should end up with a visualization like this one. We've got on the y axis here 
global CO2 emissions in kilotons, and on the x-axis, the year. Now, there's a bit of an issue here. It looks like in 2009, 2010, and 2011, um, we have zero kilotons emitted. That doesn't sound right, does it? So if you want to do this little challenge, uh, feel free to do it. But have, yeah, you can uh, pause the video now to have a think about how you might want to remove that data from the data set. Let's have a look at removing that. What we can do, and there's a few ways to do it, we can add an extra statement into our block of code here. I might copy that so you can see the difference. And after my summarizing step, I can decide that I want to filter out for the years, or actually, sorry, select only the years that are below 2009. That's one way of doing it. If I do that, I should end up with something that looks a little bit better. Now, many ways to do it. If you wanted to, you could also use some function to remove the non-available values before you did the summarizing. That's perfectly fine too. Uh, so as, as often is this the case with R, one problem often has uh, several solutions. So this is where we stop with um, looking at tidy R specifically and tidying data, tabular data. We're going to move on to a different part of the tidyverse now, which is the package per with three R's, and which is used to, with functional programming, iterate over complex objects. As you probably know, in base R you can use loops, like in many programming languages, to make your life easier and repeat an operation over and over again. An issue with that is that um, loops can be a little bit tricky to build. So people have developed functions to make your life a little bit easier, make sure that the loop functions as efficiently as it can, and uh, so you don't forget anything in the building of your loop. So let's have a look at that. Moving on to using per for iterating with functional programming. Before we look at per, I want to show you what a base R loop looks like, or a proper one at least. So let's have a look at the data set that is included by default, empty cars. If I execute this, you'll see this matrix. Oh, I think it is a matrix. I can check that. It's a data frame, actually. A data frame that contains values related to different models of cars. And if you look at the help page, you can find out more about those different variables. So this is all numerical. Uh, so that would be handy to, for example, apply an operation on each one of the columns. Say we want to find out the median of each one of those variables here, each one of those columns, we want to find the median. So if we weren't going to be using loops, if we weren't going to be using loops, we'd be applying the same function over each one of those variables one by one, we would end up with, um, that's 11 times the exact same function, but changing the variable name. We don't really want to do that. As soon as we do the exact same thing three times, we should probably think about using iteration in R. So to build a proper loop in R, here we're going to use the specific loop, the for loop. We should start with creating an output that's going to store what we want. And it has to be this, the right kind of output on the right kind of object. And this one is going to be 
a vector of the double type. And it's going to have the same number of columns as empty cars. So we want it to be the right type, and we want it to be the right size, and that makes things a lot more straightforward. The next step is to use a for loop and specify a sequence for it to repeat enough times and to take care of all the variables in the dataset. So we're saying that for each or for the, the sequence along empty cars or along the variables of empty cars, we want to repeat one operation every time it finds one. It finds one. So we've got our output that's going to store the data. We've got our sequence that's defining how many times we run the body of the loop. And finally, we've got the body of the loop that says what we're going to do with that data. And we're going to store inside the output in the position i, the median of whatever variable we're looking at right now. Okay. So because we've got 11 variables, this loop body will be repeated 11 times, and we should end up with an output that contains the right data. So let's try that. First, execute the creating of whatever object we're going to store the data in. You can see output is a numerical vector that has 11 slots, but not, no data in there. Then we can execute our for loop, this whole thing here. Now I end up with an output that con does contain data. And if I print it out here, I'll see in my console the medians of each one of our variables. You can see that there's 11 elements here. Now, this is quite a bit of work for what we just did. Um, there are functions in base R that you can access straight away, the apply family. Um, but the tidyverse brings in this package per that also uses functional programming, but makes it maybe a little bit more straightforward and um, has a bit more consistency. So I would recommend to having a look at, um, at the per functions. Um, and this specific family of functions in per is called the map family. Okay. The map family in per. If we wanted to do the exact same thing as we did before, or very similar at least, we could create the output car medians, and then use a map function. Now, if I start typing map underscore, you should see that there are quite a few functions that start with map underscore in per. And depending on what we want to get out of this process, uh, out of this iteration, we'll have to use different functions. We know that what's going to come out of our calculation will be stored as a double. So an integer, uh, sorry, a numeric that has decimals. So there is a function called map dbl, this one here, that will make sure that we get the output that we want. If you look at the help page for this specific function, you can press F1 with your cursor inside the name of the function. You'll see that the map family can be used to apply a function to each element of a vector. And there's an explanation of what the different uh, members of this family do. Here it says that map logical, map int, map double, and map character exist and return a specific type of data. If you use the map function on its own, it will return a list. That's the default. But here we know we want doubles as a result. And here we can specify that we want to process the empty cars dataset. And then 
the specific function that we want to apply to each one of its elements. And I can execute this and have a look at car medians. You can see that we get the same results, the same numbers are here. But two things to notice, it's a lot easier to type. You can see that it's a lot shorter than the whole loop that we wrote before. There's less things that you can get wrong. And also, it does a bit of extra work here. It keeps the names of each one of our variables here to make sure that we understand the output. So I find that a lot more comfortable to use and a lot more comfortable to read the output too. So we'll keep looking at examples. If I check the type of the specific vector now, car medians, I can confirm that it is of the type double. That's exactly what we specified. That's why we use the map double function. So let's try a different type. Oops, I'm going to use the comment here. Different data type as output. Let's have a look at the Star Wars uh, data set. If you type Star Wars on its own, it returns a table that has 87 rows, 13 variables, and it looks like there's a variety of variables. We're not limited to numbers now, but uh, we've got different kinds of data here, characters, integers, doubles, etc. Now one operation we could do is check in Star Wars what variables, or which variables, sorry, are of the type character. If I do that kind of operation, I probably want to end up with a vector of Boolean values, or logical values. I can start with Star Wars. That's the data that we process. And then the function that we apply to it is isCharacter. And it returns a vector, a logical vector, that tells us that, for example, name is a character vector, but height is not a character vector here. Mass is not a character vector, but hair color is a character vector. So we've iterated over each one of the variables in the Star Wars dataset and checked if it was a character vector. So we applied two functions here, median and is character, but we didn't really change the default behavior of that function. Here, to change the default behavior of the function applied, I'm repeating words here, change the default behavior, we can use extra arguments to send to that function. Here, I want to return a double vector. I'm going to work again on empty cars. And I want to find the mean, but I also want to trim the data with 20%. I can execute that, and I get the trimmed mean for each one of my variable. So this argument that follows the name of the function that we want to apply is an argument that's going to be used inside that function. If I look at the help page for mean, you can see that it does have this option trim that defaults to zero. But if I want to change that default behavior, I can add an extra argument that will be used. So that's all good. That makes it easy to change the default behavior of a function. But what if we want to use something a bit more elaborate? I'm going to still stick to map double here as a result and still use empty cars. But here what I want to do is use the round function on the mean. So I'm nesting two functions together. And this is getting a bit, bit more complex. I can't just use simple arguments for that. I'll have to use the tilde character here to then specify that I'm using a more complex formula. I'm nesting the mean inside the round function. And inside 
here the mean function, I'm going to say this is where I want to use whatever we're iterating over. So the dot x here will say I'm placing the variable here, the variable that you're currently dealing with. If I execute this, I end up again with uh, my summary of my data set, empty cars, and I've got the mean of each variable, but I've rounded that to integers. So to get ahead around this one, I'm going to change that to a different example. I want to end up with a logical result here. And what I want to have a look at is my empty cars data set, but I want to find the variables that have a max value that is bigger than three times the minimum value. So I don't know what I'm what story I'm telling with this, but I want to check which variable in this which variables in this data set have a max value that is three times bigger, or at least three times bigger than the minimum value. So let's try and do that. It's a good example of using a custom formula in a map function. Starting with empty cars as the data that we process. Using the tilde to start our formula. And I'm going to say max of the variable is bigger than three times the min of the variable. And execute that. So you can see in the result here that it has worked. I get true and false depending on if the max value is three times bigger than the min, or at least. And it shows you that you can use that dot x notation as many times as you want in the formula. So that makes it a little bit more sense to be using that dot x and as a special formula after the tilde, uh, because you can really go on to create more complicated formulas inside your map family. So we've got a little bit of a challenge here. Again, I'll explain what the challenge is. And then you can pause the video if you want to try it on your own. So we want to find out number of unique values. in each variable of the Star Wars data sets. Finding out the number of unique values in each variable of Star Wars. So let's have a look at the solution. I want to use the map int function because I want to end up with an integer for each one of my variables. Of course, at the beginning of the function, the first argument is Star Wars, what data set we deal with. That's very common in the whole tidyverse. The first argument is what we process. And then I use a custom, custom formula. And I can find the unique values of dot x. But I want to know how many there are. So I'm going to use the length function around it. So what's going to happen is it's going to take the variable, find all the unique values, and store that as a vector, and finally tell me the length of the vector itself. If I execute this, I should end up with this vector. Now we know that there's 87 different names, there's 46 different heights, and there's 13 different hair colors. Another interesting feature in the per data set is that we can split the data to then apply different, or to apply the same function actually to each section of the data. So to split a data set, we can use the split function. Let's have a look at the data set empty cars again. I want to find how many unique values there are in the uh, cylinder variable. 
So there's three of them, six, four, and eight. Now what if I want to split the empty cars data set according to this value? I can use the split function. I'm going to use the dot notation here to say from that data set we're dealing with, I'm going to split by cylinders to separate in three parts, and finally map that with the summary function. So I'm using the map function here to output a list, that's the default. And if I execute that, there'll be quite a bit of output in my console. But you can see that the summary function has been applied three times. First, on the cars that have four cylinders, and this is the result. Second, on the cars with six cylinders, this is the result. And finally, on the cars with eight cylinders, and this is the result. We can do a similar thing by associating the splitting function and a map function with ggplot functions. So you want to do same thing, splitting empty cars by the number of cylinders, and then mapping the ggplot, a ggplot formula, a ggplot command to that data. So let's use the tilde here and say ggplot is going to use the data we deal with that the pipe provides. So I can use again that dot notation because the pipe allows you to reuse it here. That's the dot. And then specify what my aesthetics will be or which variables I use associated to my two axes. That's my ggplot call. And after that, I can use the geometry function, or functions, plural. I'm going to use gm point here as well as gm smooth. Again, you can see that it creates a list, and it has applied the ggplot command three times on each one of my splits. If I navigate through my plots, I can see that I've got three plots. First one for the four, four cylinders, second one for the six cylinders, and finally for the eight cylinders. You get three different visualizations. Now, sticking to the per package, I want to talk about another number of features in there, um, we're going to talk about predicate functions. And this allows you to kind of check for a condition before applying a function. So this is particularly useful because often you have data sets that have different kinds of data in there. You don't want necessarily want to apply one function on everything. Uh, you might want to make sure you pick and choose whichever you want to apply it on. So this is called predicates. And quite a few map functions make use of them. Let's have a look at the iris dataset. It's a data frame that contains 150 observations of five variables. And the first four variables are numerical, whereas the last one is the name of the species, and it is a factor. If I want to find the mean of each one of those variables, I can try the iris, uh, sorry, not the iris double, they start with iris, send that to a map function, we want to end up with a double vector, and apply the mean function on all of the variables. If I do that, I end up with a warning. I do get a result, I get the mean for the four first variables, but I get an NA for species, it tells me warning message, Argument is not numerical logical, so I'm returning an NA. If we want to avoid this, we can use a discard function. So I'm going to use, again, iris, but add an extra discard function where we're going to remove whatever matches or whatever returns true with the function is factor. So 
So because species is a factor, it will be discarded. And then I move on to applying my mean function over the rest of the variables. And here you go. You end up without the species variable, only the numerical variables here, or at least the ones that are not factor. Let's have a look at another example. We're going to look at Star Wars now. Again, we can start with the name of the data set and the pipe. And we're going to do the opposite of discarding. We're going to keep. We're going to check with is character that the variable is a string of characters. And with those variables that we kept, we're going to apply the same thing that we did before. We want the length of the unique values of each variable. And now we end up with only the variables that are character, and the numbers are the number of unique values in there. So both discard and keep can remove or keep variables depending on the uh, predicate function. Sometimes we want to keep everything. So if we want to keep all the variables but apply a function on sum only, there is another function that we can use that makes use of predicates and it's map if. Map if can first check for that condition using a predicate function, for example, is numeric, and then specify what function we want to apply. And finally, I do want to have a look at the structure of that. So we end up with rounded values for all our numeric variables the four first ones. However, the factor hasn't been touched. It hasn't tried to apply the round function on the species variable. That's what we wanted. We wanted to keep all the variables, but only apply a function if it matched that predicate variable that we, uh, sorry, predicate function that we specified here. So that's already quite a bit of information for uh, today. Um, those are probably the elements of those two packages that I think are most important, uh, that are really important to understand and make use of. I do want to show a couple of last examples uh, to demonstrate how we can associate functions from different packages in the tidyverse. So I'll run you through this example of uh, using per, using tidy r, and, uh, oh, maybe not tidy r, but at least deploy r functions, and ending up with a visualization at the end. So what we want to have a look at is the cumulative and yearly change in CO2 emissions. And that's for all our countries. So we might want to create first a new data set that's going to store the cumulative values. We want to start with climate tidy. And we want to arrange or order the rows by country name first and second by the year. So we've got them in order. So we can then apply a function to do the cumulative sum. I'm going to group by country name. And then move on to processing my data with the mutate verb. I'm going to create a new variable called cumul CO2 kilotons, and using the cumulative sum function, 
I'm going to apply that on this variable that we've used so far for our visualization at the beginning. Another thing I want to do, maybe for later, is use the difference between years. So I can do this operation here using EN, ATM, CO2, K tons, and then remove whatever was in the previous year. Oh, so I use this lag function to use the previous value in the data set. And I can do those operations to end up with the difference between the two. The next step is that I want to map at a specific point. So it's not using map if here, it's using map at. And I'm going to specify what variables I want to use. And that's the variables that ends with kt. I only want to apply this operation to the variables that are in kilotons of CO2. And then I'm going to use the tilde to have a special formula here, not that complicated, but I want to reuse that variable n divided by 10 to the power of 6. Because I want to convert from kilotons to petagrams. I'm going to make sure that I convert that to a tibble, because remember that the map functions by default will use uh, lists or will output lists. So I want to end up with a tibble. And finally, I want to make sure that I've got the right names in there, because I converted from kilotons to pedagrams. So I'm going to use rename at. And all the variables that end with kiloton, kt, are going to be applied this operation. I'm going to replace in the name with string replace. Notice that I'm using a function from string r. This is a useful package to manipulate any text. String underscore replace, where the variable that I've selected will have the string kt replaced by pg. Now, if I've typed everything right, I should end up with a new data set here. It is called climate cumul. And if I look at the variables, you'll see at the end that it's got, it's got the cumulative CO2 in petagrams, and it's got the difference of CO2 year per year in petagrams too. Now that I've got this new data set, I can play around with it and visualize it. I'm going to save this as an object called p. I'm going to start at it with climate cumul and new data set. Move that to ggplot. I can use the aesthetic function separately if I want to. If you find that more comfortable, you can move it outside the ggplot call. That's fine. I'm using the cumul.co2.pg variable on the y-axis. That's what I want to visualize. And I'm going to color that according to the country names. Finally, I'm going to apply, oops. Sorry about that. A geometry, that's the line geometry. I'm also going to modify the theme so I don't show this legend that's going to appear and going to try and tell me all the different countries with all the different colors that are associated to them. I end up with a P object. And if I execute this P object, I should finish with this visualization. So I took the data from the World Bank, did a cumulative sum. I didn't make use of this other one, but I might use it later on, diff CO2 PG. 
And now I end up with um, this kind of spaghetti chart, not ideal, but this is the cumulative CO2 emissions in petagrams for each country. I've created an object, I've saved the object as P. If I want to make that um, interactive, there's a good package to do that. It's called Plotly, so it's not part of the Dadiverse, but it is a, a nice package to create interactive charts. And the good thing is that you can take a ggplot2 object with the ggplotly function and convert it straight away into something. So it opens in the viewer, and now I can hover over each one of those spaghettis to tell me what, it's, what it corresponds to. So you can see for year 2007, uh, when started in 1990, there, was, there is a cumulative CO2 emission of 96 petagrams um, for the United States. Then the second biggest here is China. And then we move on to Japan, India, and Germany. Right. So this is it for this particular video. Hopefully this is uh, helpful. I thought I'd present those two packages that are very central to the tidyverse. Uh, hopefully with the rest of the videos that we presented before, you get a, a nice understanding on how to use the tidyverse to manipulate data, um, to uh, do, start doing some analysis and some visualization. Hope you liked the video. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you next time. Cheers.